Hello, and welcome today to today's program, Measures and Methods for Research on Family Caregivers for People Living with Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias. I am Jim Powers, the work group lead for the GSA webinar series. My colleagues and I have presented a program here for you that I hope will be very beneficial. Please introduce yourself in the chat and know that this conversation is being recorded. You are welcome to have questions in the chat at any time. The Gerontologic Society of America and the National Institute on Aging, Division of Behavioral and Social Research are collaborating on this GSA webinar focused on recent uh, NACA priority research concepts addressing measures and methods for research on family caregivers for people living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. The webinar is designed to give interested researchers, especially new investigators, maximal lead time to contemplate, pull teams together, align research ideas, plan projects, and build successful applications. NIA DBSR program officials will give brief presentations, which will be followed by opportunities for Q&A. Again, please put these in the chat and we will provide these to the presenters. Our GSA work group consists of uh, Daniel Gann, Sam Lee, Meredith Troutman Jordan, and Pan Sosaurus. And we have a special uh, at tribute to Judy Liu, GSA Vice President for Publications and Professional Resources, who has helped make this possible. And next slide, please. <clears throat> Our work group uh, panel uh, presentation today will be by Elizabeth Necka, Elena Fazio, and Amelia Caracar, all from the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the NIA. <clears throat> Our moderator today is Stephen Albert who is the professor and chair of behavioral and community health sciences at the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health and also editor of the GSA journal, Innovation in Aging. Dr. Albert. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. It's great to have everyone together here today. Uh, we're very fortunate to have an inside view on a very important RFA from NIA Behavioral and Social Research. And uh, a very interesting, I think, development from our National Advisory Council on Aging to uh, develop an RFA on caregiving research and dementia. So uh, welcome everybody. Thanks again to the GSA staff for making this happen. And let me turn it right over to our visitors from the NIA BSR. Uh, Dr. Necco, are you starting? It's actually me, Stephen. Oh, Hi, everybody. Amelia Kirifer from the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the National Institute on Aging. Um, Nicole, would you mind sharing, uh, putting the slides up? Okay. Um, next slide, please. Um, and before I get started, I do want to acknowledge um, Nicole Kidweiler, Kid, Kidweiler, excuse me, from our division, who's um, been a huge help in putting this together, as well as the panel who's put together these, um, this, this series, as well as um, um, the GSA. Um, so we're going to talk about a few different things today, including um, the particular RFA that Steve mentioned. Steve mentioned, but first, I wanted to start with a brief overview of the grant of NIH and the grant making process, our division, our Alzheimer's disease and related dementias research priorities, then we'll talk about some of the current funding opportunities um, and conclude with sharing some resources. And my understanding is all these slides will be shared. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so before I get started, NIH, uh, as you can see by <laughs> the title of the slide, is really a place of acronyms. Um, and there are a lot of terms that we use and we don't even realize that we're using them at the National Institutes of Health. And the first, um, just to make sure that we're level setting and on the same page as I see, and this is an NIH Institute or Center. So for example, the National Institute on Aging or the Fogarty International Center. Um, there are three types of ways that research is supported um, at NIH, and these we refer to as mechanisms. So grants are the most relevant, as well as the cooperative agreements and contracts. 
Um, the third term I want to introduce is activity code. Um, so you might have heard someone talk about an R01 that they have, or they're developing an R21, a K01, a K99, R00, a kangaroo, it's sometimes called. These different activity codes have different budgets, different project periods, how long they are, uh, and different purposes, for example, research versus training. Um, and finally, one of the most important things to know are about the different types of funding opportunity announcements. Um, so PAs, PARs, PASs, RFAs, and OCs. Um, if you're confused, don't worry because we're gonna talk about what all of those mean. Next slide, please. So whenever you apply to the National Institute, it's, it's institutes of Health, um, we'll just say National Institute on Aging for um, right now, you are applying to a specific funding opportunity announcement or FOA and a variety of different types. Um, some of the ones that we'll feature later on um, in a little while from my colleague Elena are request for applications or RFAs. Um, and these are particularly significant because they're typically a one-time solicitation. There's usually one shot. Um, but also they have um, set aside funds. So funds are dedicated um, to these particular uh, to these particular RFAs. So conditional on receiving uh, well-reviewed science, we will pay things um, in this area. RFAs also typically have um, a special locus of review. So the panel of the reviewers is um, chartered specifically for that RFA. We also have a variety of program announcements or PAs, including a program announcement with special review, a PAR. I think of the R as standing for review. So the reviewers might be um, different than for a typical um, standing study section. We also have program announcements with set aside or PASs. And when I see set aside, um, I think dollar bills. So set aside meaning um, set aside funds um, for that PAS. Um, they're also just standard program announcements. So most of the science that comes into NIH actually comes into parent announcements. So these are investigator initiated. They're not on a particular topic. Um, and that's really where uh, a lot of the science, um, what drives a lot of our science. Um, there are also notices of special interest or no sees And these may be linked to program announcements. Um, and they're often used to signal research priorities. So a topic, for example, that we're interested in and we want the research community to know, um, and they'll be associated with an existing program announcement. Next slide, please. So the NIH application and funding process is a long road. Um, so first, as I said, all applications are submitted to a funding opportunity announcement. Then the application goes um, to the Center for, Center for Receipt and Referral, um, which decides on which IC, so which institute or center um, is most appropriate, as well as the appropriate study section, the locus of review. Um, and there's actually a form where you can request a particular institute study section, um, the assignment request form, but it's CSR that ultimately decides. So study sections, but where your science is reviewed by, by external um, peer reviewers um, may either be through a central study section at the Center for Scientific Review um, or um, a study section that's specifically administered um, through a particular institute. Um, the application goes to the scientific review officer once it's been assigned to a study section who assigns um, three um, um, specific reviewers. Um, based on the scores um, that these reviewers provide, usually the top half of applications will be fully discussed in the study section. Um, all members in the study section who are not in conflict with your application will score it, but really um, assume only these three reviewers, assigned reviewers, will read carefully. A summary statement is issued for every application, whether it's discussed or not, um, and including, if appropriate, the impact score and percentile. Are you going to be funded? The funding likelihood is determined mainly by the funding line or allocation, um, the summary statement comments, so the record of the, the review if your application was discussed, um, and the adequacy with which the applicant addresses these comments. Um, after the study section review, the applications on funding list go to an advisory council for second, uh, second review. Stephen's already mentioned our advisory council and some other activities that they engage in will be discussed. Um, typically, applications at the advisory council are approved on block, 
Um, and like many of your departments, we also have a lot of meetings. And actually, after our advisory council, um, there's an internal NIA funding meeting. At some point past this point, uh, past this, this event, you'll re be requested for just in time documents, um, including updated other support, human subjects, uh, materials, etc. And then the notice of award, which is when the funding is official and it's really time to celebrate. Um, the fastest that this realistically happens is nine months. So it's important to start planning early. Uh, next slide, please, Nicole. So the crux of any application and much of your interactions with program officials, such as myself and my colleagues, is the specific aims page. And this is really um, should include everything that's important, that's exciting, that's innovative, that's significant um, about your application. So it's the um, you know the scientific question, the hypotheses, your data and methods at a high level. Um, you might think of this as sort of the gestalt of what you propose to do. Um, for many reviewers, especially those who aren't assigned the application, this may be the only part of your application that they look at. Um, some people ask me, oh, how many aims should I have? There's no magic number of aims, but it should be appropriate for the activity code. So whether it's an R01, say, or an R21, um, the budget and concomitant budget and project period. Um, my motto, motto in life, but also in some um, specific aims pages is to do less better. It's far preferable to have two good aims than three so-so aims. Um, you really want to fully develop and motivate and describe um, everything that you're doing in your application um, at a high level in the aims page. Next slide, please. Um, and here are just a few of our general application tips. Um, and the first is that grantsmanship matters. So be clear and coherent in your application. Use visual cues to guide the reviewer through your application. This can be things like you know, a strategic use of a bold font, um, numbering the sections so that the application corresponds to the um, criteria that the reviewer is asked to um, evaluate. Um, strategic use of tables to highlight things that are especially important or your conceptual model. Um, it's also important to be honest about the weaknesses of your work. Acknowledging these shows your sophistication, and I can guarantee that reviewers will find them anyways and propose alternative strategies to address potential weaknesses. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, is that um, R01s are only for primary data collection. Secondary data analyses are funded, including for R01 applications. However, R01 applications have higher expectations of preliminary data and power analyses. Uh, regardless of the activity code um, that you are submitting to or the FOA, you always want to write the most rigorous, innovative, and high-impact application you can. Um, and a couple of general guiding questions um, may help you to think about the big picture. Um, and these actually correspond to two of the review criteria um, um, for, for, most, for most activity codes. So the first is, does this application address an important scientific question or problem? Is this significant? Is this something that's important to do? If it's not addressing a real problem or a question, uh, what's the point of doing it, even if you have great methods and data? Um, and that leads to the next sort of big question, which is um, approach. Will the data methods measures um, used yield a rigorous answer to the scientific question or problem? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, a big tip that I have is that there are a lot of resources available on the web. Um, and one of the great tools is NIH Reporter, which you see a quick link here. Um, can you build, Nicole, I think there's another piece of information. Um, and one of the things that it does is it has this neat feature called Matchmaker. Um, you can enter actual abstracts or titles of your uh, proposed science to find out which program officials are sort of the best match scientifically for you to give you advice. NIH Reporter is also really useful because every application that's funded by NIH is searchable and findable um, in this database. Uh, next slide. Um, this is also just a, a little bit of a drill down into Reporter um, so that you can see more information on the kinds of uh, projects that might be associated with a particular institute or program official. Uh, next slide. 
So when you talk to a program official or officer, their program official officer are used interchangeably. First is to do your homework, um, learn about the Institute, learn about what our priorities are. As I said, there's a lot of information available on the web. Um, then prepare your specific aims page. So I've provided some tips um, already. Um, and this is really helpful for us as program officials to really um, make the most of, of time that you have when you interact with the program official. So when do you talk to a PO? When you have an idea on paper, but maybe you don't even know the right institute or the activity code. The big question I have with people is, should this be an R01 or should this be an R21? Um, then when you're preparing to submit, but maybe you want broad feedback or advice on the FOA study section, um, maybe you're submitting a large application and you need advanced permission. It's also appropriate to talk to a PO after your summary statement is issued, regardless of what the score is or whether it was discussed or not. Um, and then finally, post award for updates, discussion um, about potential supplements and renewals. Next slide, please. Um, another great resource for NIA is our NIA blog. Um, and this includes, this is, comes out every Wednesday. Um, and includes um, useful information about policies, scientific goings on. Um, and this is just um, a recent, uh, recent blog, relatively recent blog post cited with a colleague in neuroscience um, with more tips on communicating with program officers or officials. Um, next slide. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Elena Fizio. Take it away, Elena. Thank you, Amelia. Um, I am Elena Fazio. As Amelia notes, I'm also a program officer in the Division of Behavioral and Social Research, BSR. I'll use that acronym going forward. For my part, I'm going to provide some overview information about NIA and then give you some information about BSR's Alzheimer's portfolio, as well as give uh, some information about an upcoming dementia care summit, followed by specific funding opportunity announcements before I turn to Liz Necka. As you see here, NIA as the Broad Institute has several missions and goals. The first is to support and conduct genetic, biological, clinical, behavioral, social, and economic research on aging. Next, to foster the development of not only research, but clinician scientists in aging. Another goal is to provide research resources. And of course, last but not least, the dissemination of information to various audiences. Next slide. NIA has five extramural offices. So there is the Division of Aging Biology. They support molecular, cellular, and genetic research on the mechanisms of aging. There is BSR, which is um, the Division of Behavioral and Social Research again. And we support social, behavioral, psychological, and economic research, as well as research training on the processes of aging at both the individual and societal level. BSR fosters cross-disciplinary research at multiple levels from genetics to cross-national comparative work. The Division of Geriatrics and Clinical Gerontology, or GCG, supports clinical and translational research on health and disease in the aged and research on aging over the entire human lifespan, including its relationships to health outcomes. GCG, FOCI, include translational research for the development of new interventions for age-related conditions, prevention and treatment of multiple chronic conditions in older adults, and studies that help to promote evidence-based geriatric care and inform policies affecting older adults. The Division of Neuroscience supports research to further the understanding of neural and behavioral processes associated with the aging brain. Research on the dementias of old age, in particular Alzheimer's disease, is one of the program's highest priorities. The Division of Extramural Activities manages NIA's grant and training policies and procedures career development programs, the small business innovation project and projects, and the technology transfer program, among other things. Next slide. So as previously noted, DBSR supports social, psychological, economic, and behavioral research on the process of aging and Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease-related dementias at both the individual and population levels. You may know that there are more generous funding lines for what I'll refer to as AD research. The AD work supported in our division is noted here in a color wheel on screen. Please do feel free to contact um, Amelia, Liz, any program officer in our division if you're interested in submitting an aging application in, to us 
at NIA or an Alzheimer's application. And if you are thinking about an Alzheimer's application, I might be a good first step. Um, if you're considering, um, in fact, the Alzheimer's lane, you might want to check out our research implementation database that shows our Alzheimer's milestones. And there's a link for that on this screen. Next page. So NIA has a national advisory council, council that we call NACA. This was mentioned um, at the outset of our presentation that approves all concepts. Um, they are typically ideas that turn into, as Amelia said, requests um, for application or RFAs. So on screen, you see a set of example concepts that were approved back in 2019. Um, they focus on a range of topics, including the topics of health disparities, macro social trends and aging. It has, we have some um, concepts from that time that focus on the lifespan and cognitive aging, technology and, and access to data and beyond. So you can check out this list for um, past concepts and then I'll talk a little bit more about current and future RFAs. Next slide. Um, you may be aware that every three years we hold a research summit on dementia care and dementia caregiving. The goal of these care summits is to bring together individuals with a variety of backgrounds to identify evidence-based programs, strategies, and beyond that can help uh, those living with dementia in terms of care services and supports. The first summit of this type was held in 2017 and the second in 2020. In addition to the care summits, NIA organizes the National Institutes of Health Alzheimer's Research Summits. Um, we refer to them as the AD Summit. And then there's the um, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke or the NINDS summit that focuses on the related dementias. The intent of each of these summits, ones held each year, is to assess research gaps and opportunities that reflect scientific priorities for research on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. The summits are a part of a coordinated NIH effort to respond to the national plan to address Alzheimer's disease, sometimes referred to as NAPA. There is currently a request for information or an RFI that you should see on screen here for the 23 um, CARE Summit. And comments are due by October 21st. We encourage you to uh, write comments, uh, asking for uh, potential additions or um, to the agenda or giving us updates on current and future innovations in the areas of dementia care and um, dementia caregiving. The actual summit, as you see here, is going to be held between March 20 and 22 of 2023, um, and uh, it will be a purely virtual event. So we thank you in advance for sharing this RFI, and we hope you're able to attend that summit. Next slide. Um, as noted before, you can visit this link here to see the current approved concepts that NIA's uh, council or NACA has approved. Um, looking at approved concepts can give you, a researcher, a heads up on potential future funding opportunity announcements. For example, next slide. Um, this is a current funding opportunity announcement that focuses on policy and AD healthcare disparities. Um, I'm actually the contact for this particular RFA. Here where the call is for R01 applications to address variations in social and healthcare policies to employ experimental, quasi-experimental, experimental or other innovative approaches to uncover mechanisms driving disparities in care for those living with dementia. Um, so please do check out the FAQs and contact me if you are thinking of applying. Next slide. Um, the impetus for this pair of RFAs, which are probably of great interest to you on today's call, um, is a series of changes in family structure, for example, changes in divorce rates and step families, and increasing diversity of American families that may alter the dynamics of caregiving for those living with dementia. We know that family members provide most of the caregiving for people living with dementia, and that changes in what families look like may mean less traditional family caregivers. Further, some of the factors such as race, education, and ethnicity associated with family changes are also risks, risk factors for dementia, making understanding new family forms important for disparities in dementia care. Growing diversity of United States the growing diversity of the United States includes groups more likely to develop dementia. 
those about whom we have little family information in many existing surveys. The purpose of these RFAs is to support development of methods and measures for capturing expanded definitions of family and related concepts relevant to informal caregiving for those living with dementia and for the implementa implementation of these measures in new and existing studies, so typically R01s. There's also a companion R21 RFA for the testing of these measures and populations understudied in dementia research and for projects lacking preliminary data. Next slide. These two PARs, as we refer to them, are where you should go if you wish to submit dementia care or dementia caregiving clinical trials or interventions. Please do contact Drs. Ankin or Dr. Bhattacharya before you apply. And the work you submit through these announcements should be situated within the NIH stage model. Liz Necka is actually going to talk about the stage model to follow. Liz? Thanks so much, Elena. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the NIH stage model is a model of behavioral intervention development that we're really encouraging our investigators to adopt. Um, and part of the reason why we're encouraging this model is because of our perspective from sort of a 50,000 foot view in terms of where we see gaps in terms of the translation of behavioral interventions from the lab to ultimate uh, implementation and dissemination. So the stage model is comprised of a number of different stages. Next. The next. The first is basic science, which is stage zero. Um, and so um, a lot of the research that NIH supports does fall within this realm of basic science. Next. The following stage is stage one, which is intervention uh, generation and development, refinement, modification, adaptation, and pilot testing. Next. Stage two and stage three are both traditional um, efficacy testing. Stage two is typically in the context of a research setting um, in a highly controlled environment, whereas stage three is uh, more in a community setting, still much more controlled than ultimately uh, an intervention will be when it is ultimately disseminated and uh, implemented. Next. Stage four is effectiveness research. Next. And stage five is dissemination and implementation research. Next. So the ultimate goal of the NIH stage model is to produce highly potent and maximally implementable behavioral interventions. And although the stages are numbered, it, it, there's no prescription that you need to go in the order um, stage zero through five. In fact, it's expected that people will jump around between these different stages depending on what the research question that they're asking is. Ultimately, this goal of producing implementable and potent interventions breaks down into sort of two key principles. The first is a focus on mechanisms of behavior change at every stage of behavioral intervention development. And the second is consideration of ease of implementation as early as possible. Next, please. So the NIH stage model is an example of an experimental medicine approach. Next. So typically, uh, traditional efficacy testing would focus on intervention. Next. Next, and um, uh, imagining how that is related to behavior change. Next, but an experimental medicine approach really encourages investigators to think about why it is that an intervention might be producing the behavior change of interest. So what is the putative target that the intervention is going to um, be focused on? Next, and is that a valid target? So does engaging that target actually produce behavior change? Next. And this together is the mechanism of action. So to give you an analogy, I have a very picky eater at home. My daughter is two years old and I want her to eat more spinach. So perhaps a behavior change that I'm interested in is getting my daughter to eat more spinach. And in, in, uh, a putative target, a way I think that I might be able to get her to eat more spinach would be to make her actually like the taste of spinach, right? So that would be my putative target. And I can make sure that that's a valid target by saying, well, does she like the taste of ice cream? Yes, she does. Does she eat ice cream? She does. So that suggests that actually enjoying that, that, that taste, having a preference for that taste um, is a valid target for making her eat that food. 
So then as an intervention, I would want to try to change her taste buds. So maybe I start by sneaking some spinach into smoothies, and then I slowly start to increase the amount of spinach I'm giving her in other types of meals and slowly change her taste buds. And if I was able to actually change her taste preferences, um, that would be suggest that I've actually engaged the target with this mini intervention I'm doing in my own household, right? So this is a, an illustrative example. Obviously, uh, there are, this is not the type of intervention that NIA <laughs> would be supporting, but I wanted to sort of break down how the and a focus on experimental medicine approach really emphasizes mechanisms of action. And the reason to do that is then let's say that in the future there's more children. Um, I could know what it was that actually helped my first child start to uh, eat more spinach. Next. Now, of course, there's also a focus in, in this and in thinking about mechanisms of action of what are the essential ingredients. So, do, you know, is it, um, do I need to start with something that's really sweet, like a smoothie, or could I have started with something that was a little bit less sweet, right? That's an example of an essential ingredient. Was the smoothie actually re required? Next, please. And so the reason why I'm pointing this out is because uh, focus on mechanism of action is actually a responsiveness criteria for the PAR, um, PAR 21307 that Elena mentioned. And as uh, Amelia mentioned at the beginning, a PAR is a program announcement with special review criteria. These particular PARs are reviewed by program staff prior to uh, peer review to ensure that they are responsive to the FOA. And if an application is deemed to be non-responsive to the FOA, it can be withdrawn prior to review. And so what that means is that one of the review criteria for this application is that there needs to be a hypothesized mechanism of action or hypothesized essential ingredients. And these must be based upon quantitative data. So we're really encouraging investigators to focus on this mechanism of action when they're developing their behavioral interventions. And the reason for this is, again, the stage model is encouraging the development of ultimately potent and implementable interventions. And when what we've seen is that often things break down with, uh, in between efficacy and effectiveness testing and then ultimate dissemination and implementation. And part of this, we, we believe, may be because the people who are ultimately doing implementation and dissemination are not clear on why an intervention is working. And so they may make changes that ultimately um, invalidate the intervention, essentially uh, change, remove the mechanism of action. Uh, next, please. So to sort of put that in a broader picture, next. Often we think of interventions as being a bit of a black box, next. And there may be essential components around them, uh, in, you know, circulating around them, but we're not really sure necessarily what they are. Next, next. And in a traditional efficacy testing model, we would say, but this, you know, this black box, this, this has worked. And we think that all of these things are important. That's why we developed the intervention to be this way. Um, so therefore this perfect black box with these specific spheres are what need to be um, implemented next. However, when we move to effectiveness, we may see that this works next. But what we've noticed as NIA is that oftentimes, in fact, it doesn't. And one reason that may be is because there's a lot of heterogeneity once you move to effectiveness, not only in the people that you're trying to reach, but in the ways in which you're trying to reach them. Next. And we wanted to know why that is. And so it's possible that, you know, in people or uh, in delivery modes that are similar to the initial efficacy testing, indeed, having a box with certain components in it is um, going to engage that target and that target is going to be valid. Next. But it's possible that for other individuals, there may be certain characteristics of certain groups where actually what's most important from that initial intervention is the yellow sphere, whatever that yellow sphere is. And the red sphere is important too, but you know what you can do without the blue and the purple and the green. Next. Or maybe you need all of the spheres, but really it's about the, the, the format that you're delivering them in. So they, they're not spheres, they're the same colors, but you need cylinders, right? Next. And when we ultimately build out to dissemination and implementation, next, we may see that you know, we, there's going to be changes that need to be made based on the original intervention to make something uh, more easily disseminable. And so perhaps there's a, you know, a bag instead of a box, but ultimately that will work next for some portion of the population, next. But by focusing on mechanisms of action, next, 
we may see that, okay, well, if uh, cost savings needs to be made, or, you know, we don't have time for the original intervention, or whatever we were, you know, the analogy is for this black box that initially was there, we're, instead of doing a bag, let's do a smaller box, okay? Let's have, save on our resources um, by doing a smaller box, because we know we only need to include the yellow sphere and the red sphere. Next. Or we can change the size of our, the shape of our box, as long as we make sure that what's in there is a cylinder. Next. So ultimately, this approach is uh, what we're really trying to encourage for our behavioral in interventions. And you'll see that many of our um, the notices of special interest, which Amelia highlighted at the beginning, um, that focus on our priorities uh, in the Alzheimer's disease and related dementia space, uh, have specific clauses in them that encourage behavioral intervention development to go to one of those two PARs that Amelia, uh, that Elena mentioned, PAR 21307 and PAR 21308, which have those responsiveness criteria. Now, here I'm showing you a number of different NOCEs that are all associated with two PARs, the, um, the top two rows, one for an R01 and one for an R21. We like to consider these sort of parent um, Alzheimer's disease funding opportunity announcements. And what that means is that they are broadly to support R01s and R21s that are investigator-initiated ideas that are in the realm of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, however, we have specific notices of special interest that highlight our priorities um, in this research space, which are the rest of the um, uh, rows in this table. And those, we encourage investigators who are submitting to these PARs to tie one of these notices of special interest to their uh, application. Uh, you do that by putting it in box 4B of your SF-424 R&R form. Uh, and by putting it in the, that box, and that lets us know how you think of your research as fitting with NIA priorities. Uh, the benefit of coming in through one of these PARs is that you get a special receipt date. Um, so you get about an extra month in terms of preparing your application. They do go typically to standing study sections. So they'll be referred to review based on our um, division of receipt and referral. And, um, if you do decide to submit an Alzheimer's disease uh, funding uh, application to a parent funding announcement, so not one of these two, um, but just a sort of investigator initiated funding opportunity, um, that would also be appropriate, but you don't get that benefit of an extra month. And you also don't get that benefit of saying, you know, NIA, this is consistent with your priorities in this specific NOCI. Next. Uh, and as, you may be aware NIA does pay on a publicly posted pay line, um, and that pay line does differ based on the type of research that you're doing. Um, now, there's a tremendous funding advantage for work that's relevant to Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. So what we're showing here is an example of uh, our fiscal year 22 pay line. Um, and so you can see that for early stage investigators who are submitting R01s uh, that were in the general pay line, it was uh, 19th percentile, whereas those who are submitting applications that were related to Alzheimer's disease and related dementias it was in the 33rd percentile. Um, and just in general, for all of our applications, regardless of Alzheimer's disease um, focus or not, being a uh, an early stage investigator, um, which is someone who's within 10 years of their PhD, or being a new investigator, which is someone who's never held an NIH level, um, an R level NIH grant before, um, does have a bit of an advantage uh, in terms of applications for R01s, but this does not apply, for example, for R21s. Um, and Please note also that most of our applications are less than $500,000 in terms of the requested budget. Uh, for those that are uh, over $500,000, you do need prior approval from NIA to submit that application. And also the pay lines are uh, stricter. Next slide, please. So uh, I hope that you take away from this that we are approachable and we would love to speak with you about your ideas. Please contact us. Um, of course, Elena and Amelia and I are always happy to take questions, um, but you'll get a copy of these slides afterwards that has these links and we encourage you to look at our workshop reports, which is how we start thinking about some of the future funding opportunities we might be um, considering pursuing. You can review our active funding opportunities. You can always find out about the activities of various different networks and centers that we support and follow us on um, the, our Twitter account uh, for the latest updates. Next, please.
And here's a, just a brief overview. I'm not gonna go through this all, but this will be in the slides of all the different program officers in our division and their uh, areas of expertise. Next, please. And we encourage you to sign up for our blog where you'll get the latest updates on new funding opportunities so that you'll be able to maximize the time that you know about those funding opportunities and prepare an application. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very, very much. They were terrific talks, wonderful slides and really informative. I didn't know about the matchmaker function of NIH reporter, for example. And I hope people take away that uh, the BSR program staff here are really here to help. They would like to see you funded. Uh, it's kind of formidable to submit a proposal to NIH, uh, but there are terrific resources available on the web. And uh, once you're a little further along by contacting uh, the program uh, officers. So please take advantage of that. I've been watching the chat. I see we have a terrific array of investigators uh, from all kinds of different fields, from social work and clinical medicine to human development and uh, nursing and everything in between. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I want to thank our speakers for leaving some time for questions. And now it's your turn as participants uh, to take advantage of, of uh, the expertise we have with us today. Just a couple of ground rules. This is not the right forum for vetting your particular research idea. This is more like uh, how to approach these RFAs or program announcements uh, if there was something unclear about the stages model or the, inter, uh, uh, the intervention development or anything like that, uh, that would be appropriate. So why don't, why don't you please uh, raise your hand or put something in the chat uh, and we can take it from there. Already I see a couple of questions have come in. I may not be so good at uh, uh, recapping what you'd like, but uh, one question uh, is about the R21. Uh, it's exploratory in nature, but do you need pilot data for an R21? Uh, I wonder if one of our NIH uh, guests could comment on that. Yeah, that's that's a great question, Dr. Dr. Powell asked that question. Um, I think whatever you have, uh, you want to show the reviewers everything possible that convinces them that you're going to be successful. However, like you said, uh, classically we think of the R21 as high risk or high reward. So um, it may not be that you have pilot data. I mean, it might depend on exactly what it is you're proposing, but maybe it's um, fielding a study in a particular population. Maybe you haven't fielded the study already, but you have existing, um, you know, longstanding relationships with, with people in that community. You have an advisory board. You've been working in that, in that community for a while. That might be one example of sort of how to frame um, preliminary data or, um, you know, sort of the, the background material to, to lend credibility to reviewers. Okay, I see already the, uh, we have a couple of compliments coming in too that uh, the people have met with uh, the project officers, including some here and had very positive experience. They were extremely helpful, all in capitals. So I guess that means you were good. So uh, yes, that just supports what we were saying before that, that you really should reach out to the expertise here and, and it's very, very valuable in preparing a proposal. Uh, I see another question here about uh, experiments. Uh, is there a preference maybe for experimental studies over observational studies, or is that too broad a question and uh, maybe hard to answer without having a particular research question in mind? I, I saw this question as being in the context of the stage model. I'll, I'll answer your sort of broad question, Stephen, and then I'll also make a comment about the stage model. So we support um, a wide variety of research approaches, um, including observational um, research, uh, causal inference, but ranging all the way up to, you know, your standard uh, 
randomized controlled trial, right? Um, so those are all appropriate approaches and we really encourage the best approach for the research question that you're interested in asking. And that's another type of question that you could ask your program officer. Um, in the context of the stage model, um, so stage one is actually the um, stage in which the intervention is typically developed uh, and it's sub broken up into two different uh, sort of sub stages. There's stage 1A, which is really where the development maybe is uh, community-based community participatory research design where you're uh, thinking about what are the needs of the community or doing iterative user testing. That's the type of work that often happens um, in stage 1A. And it's not typically you know, a randomized controlled trial or even really um, experimental. Um, where stage 1B is often a, a form of pilot testing. Testing. Um, this is typically where you're evaluating feasibility and acceptability, and there may be, um, you know, an experimental design in terms of, you know, multiple groups. So you have an active intervention and a control condition, but there doesn't need to be. NIH considers any um, uh, a, a, a single condition where you've experimentally manipulated something uh, to be an intervention. Um, and so that is actually something to be aware of if you are proposing to do a single arm, uh, you know, test of uh, feasibility, acceptability, um, and if you're looking at preliminary efficacy testing. Because in that case, even if you only have a single condition, NIH would consider that a clinical trial. But that's typically stage 1B. So stage 1A might not necessarily be experimental, but stage 1B would be. Okay, another question came in. Uh, there was a link in about the stage model, uh, but the person is asking for, uh, are there other sources on that. I think we are going to make the slides available, and I know there were at least two publications about the stage model linked on that slide. Do you want to mention any other uh, research in this area? I just put the link that's also in the slides uh, in the chat, but there um, we recently produced a video um, that really dives into the details of the stage model, which is uh, featured on the website that I just sent. Um, and it's a bit long, but I encourage you to go to YouTube because then you can look at the different bookmarks and focus on the stage that you might be interested in and just watch that portion of the video. Oh, and we have a compliment too from a couple of people. Excellent video and video is great. So. It must be worth going to. Uh, terrific. Uh, okay. Um, other questions anyone has? I would like to say just for one practical question. Uh, those grant deadlines are imminent in October. Do you see this going out through the, the next year at least? Will there be other opportunities to submit to these R RFAs and program announcements? So um, I'll say a stab at that and Amelia and, and uh, Liz can add as well. So we the select RFAs that we showed you are ones that as of right now, there's only a plan for one receipt date um, in October. They are but a small fraction of, of what we support. And so I would encourage folks to, to look at them in terms of the topics. And if you're not able to submit now, maybe you have an idea that could be your own generated topic as we refer to them, you know, an investigator generated application. And, and then suggest looking at the, the slide um, that Liz showed you that has the uh, more parent announcements, we call them, is sort of the, the generic, if they're Alzheimer's, those are the ones we'd go to. And you could do your own um, application to those parent awards or funding opportunity announcements. And always be on a lookout for future concepts that often turn into requests um, for applications or RFAs. But we don't want to discourage you from you know, submitting some really great and important science just because you don't find an RFA that fits you right now. You should always you know, consider generating your own work through one of those parent um, announcements. Great. Uh, we also have a question about opportunities for international research. Uh, can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely, Dr. Davis. Um, actually, uh, one thing I did want to we do want to clarify is that almost all of the um, awards that are made are made to institutions, not to individual PIs. So um, if you're at um, you know the University of uh, wherever, the award is to that institution, not to you yourself. In the case of um, international institutions, um, those require. Um, a particular, you know, additional level of 
um, review. Um, generally, there's a high bar to make that um, the work cannot be done at a US institution, but it is possible. However, more broadly, um, our division has a, a strong interest in comparative research and actually has invested um, in a variety of tools so um, to facilitate that. So you may be familiar um, with the health and retirement study um, which is a US-based uh, nationally representative cohort of older of adults 50 and older. Um, however, at this point, there are a series of sister studies to the HRS that have uh, launched in a variety of countries um, from India to Korea to China um, to uh, share, which encompasses a variety of countries in Europe as well as Israel. Uh, there's one in Brazil that's getting started. Um, and I just put in the chat the gateway to global aging, which is sort of a cross block of a lot of these sister studies for HRS. So um, international comparative work is um, both international and comparative work, I should say, is uh, definitely of interest to the division. Great. OK, and I hope people can see the chat, all kinds of great links there. Uh, other questions from the audience? I'll just throw one out, you know, I, I think I mentioned this earlier that caregiving and even dementia caregiving is not a new topic in gerontology or NIA even. It's been around at least for 30 years. We have whole conferences devoted to it and meta-analyses of interventions and lots else. Uh, can the program officers speak to, you know, what they think is most innovative in caregiving research maybe uh, and uh, just to give people a feel for where the field is moving as they see it. Sorry for that tough one. Yeah, so I, so a few things. Um, you know, we can only share what's publicly available information about priorities. So um, what if you're looking at caregiving in dementia care and um, dementia caregiving specifically, um, I would encourage you, I'll, I'll put the link into our um, milestone areas, our research milestone areas, and there's a section of those milestones, I call them the 13 series, where they're all numbered with 13, that are focused specifically on dementia care and caregiving and our, our public um, facing uh, research priorities that come from our research summits. So that's one, one place to go. I would also say, you know, looking at our RFAs is a signal of some of our interests. So um, I spoke very briefly about an RFA that Amelia is the lead on and that Liz Neck and I are also on, which is actually the name of that was proposed for this session right here about methods related to caregiving. So um, that I would say is a strong signal of, of a priority interest around the, the, the methods and measurement related to the changing arc of, of families. And I don't know if Amelia wants to add to that at all. Yeah, I was going to say um, exactly exactly that it's even it's a nice tee up for the rfa i mean uh really our motivation for that rfa was a recognition that families are changing they're more complex there's a lot of inequity um, within and between them and the concern that our existing survey measures and current approaches may not be fully capturing um, ways in which the family broadly defined and defined in diverse ways by different individuals and communities uh, play in um, in caregiving for folks with with Alzheimer's disease. So I think really having the uh, methods keep methods and measures keep up with the reality. I mean, even the question of how different groups define caregiving is not necessarily straightforward. Um, so um, really, an interest I would say in um, methods and measures that are in the service of um, supporting um, the best best aging experience as possible for everybody. Good. I'll also just, oh, sorry, Thanks. I'll just add one more thing, which is that, you know, these priorities that are our NIA priorities don't come from uh, sort of just from us. Um, we are a federal agency and uh, we have many stakeholders whose interests we are interested in representing. Um, these are taxpayer dollars that are supporting this research. And so we do have a lot of opportunities like the dementia care summits that Elena outlined, where you can get involved either in your capacity as a researcher um, or in your capacity as a, you know, sort of private 
citizen um, to to you know be part of the conversation. Those are those are early um, meetings that inform where where we see gaps and where we see needs for research. Um, and so those are great opportunities, you know, to to listen into how the conversation is. Um, uh, ongoing, but also to potentially participate and ask questions and contribute uh, during the question and answer sessions. Great, great, great idea. We have another question here uh, uh, regarding the NOSI on dementia workforce, dementia care workforce. Uh, does that someone want to speak to that? I can speak to that, although I did not see the specific question. So is there more specificity or is it a general? Well, Could you talk about the no? Okay. Um, yeah, so we um, that particular notice is is coming primarily out of our population and social processes branch, um, which means that we're looking at um, typically uh, work done by demographers, sociologists, economists on on the sort of the demography of the dementia care workforce. Um, we also within our division have a whole bunch of work on work that's not specific to this particular notice. So that notice um, is primarily thinking about future needs, projections in terms of dementia care workforce, really more from a demographic perspective. But we, as I mentioned, have a whole host of other work that we do and in, in support that would look more at the experience of work, for example, or our colleagues in the division of geriatrics and clinical gerontology tend to focus more on like the training of, of, the, of the dementia care workforce. So if you're interested in the workforce broadly, I'm happy to point you to the right folks. And for that particular notice, um, there's some outline of, of potential questions and topic areas that really are thinking more forward looking about what are some of the challenges and opportunities for the dementia care workforce over the next decades. Right. And I see in the chat, uh, Amelia, you've uploaded the, the reissue of this particular NOSI. Thanks. Okay. Uh, other questions? We just have a few minutes left. And I want to give our panelists or uh, doc, uh, Dr. Bowers a chance to comment. Jim, would you like to wrap us up then? Thank you, uh, Steve, for uh, uh, really uh, uh, chairing uh, some um, complicated questions uh, about processes and hopefully providing some guidance uh, to new investigators in GSA. And thank you panelists uh, for your expertise and, and guidance. Uh, I also have learned a lot uh, from your presentations today. And I think on behalf of uh, GSA and the membership at large, uh, we really appreciate the collaboration of the NIA as we uh, present uh, these, uh, um, these uh, webinars. Uh, this is uh, actually the second that we have done. Uh, we've done some other topical uh, presentations and uh, we hope to do more of these in the future. So. Thank you so much uh, for your support. And I would just like to add, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, meet everyone today. And I really feel that uh, BSR is in very good hands with the terrific program officers we have there. And uh, this should really be a very good inspiration and spur to some terrific research. So good luck with your proposals. And uh, let, let's see what we can contribute to uh, the dementia care challenge. Thank you, everybody.